I'm a lecturer in psychology and have been so for eight years now here at John Mills. And um, I've been practicing mindfulness meditation for more than 20 years. And well, over the last few years I was, I was able to, to bring the more personal, private life interests more and more into my work. And in general there has been a, a huge increase in, in the interest in, in mindfulness so that it became feasible to, to actually really do research in this area. And the, well, the fir my first projects are probably started about five years ago and, and meanwhile all the research I'm doing is related to mindfulness practice and meditation practice in general and what kind of psychological and physiological effects it can have. Yeah. Right. That's amazing actually, you've been practicing for 20 years and it's just recently it's it's spilled into your professional life then. Yeah, I mean in a way, it because because it's it's about well it's psychology in a way it's always uh, connected yeah but but only then it really it really be it really came together you know it it depends on the on the outer situation that it became kind of viable to do something like this without ruining one's own career <laughs> and but but also I, I think I, be, I became more and more independent in the work I'm doing, so it, it was easier to di direct the, what, my work in the direction I wanted. Many people say one cannot really explain what mindfulness is, one has to experience it. But if one wants to explain it, it is about developing a new habit, how we relate to our experiences. Yeah? So usually we take most of the things we experience really at face value as it is and with mindfulness one develops a kind of inner space or inner freedom to see experiences as they come while they are there and when they disappear again and having the freedom to decide whether to respond to them or not. Yeah? So because every experience comes and goes and depends on so many different aspects they are not as real as we think, yeah. And to to really understand this gives gives a lot of freedom. Yeah? Of course, one can get a conceptual understanding of it, and one can get a conceptual understanding of the taste of a banana. But if you never taste it, it it will just be an idea. Yeah? But if in the moment people really start practicing mindfulness, and suddenly they experience that. Uh, maybe a, a very threatening thought yeah? can disappear again without us having to respond to it. It's something completely else than just talking about it. Yeah? It's not not necessarily a relaxation practice. Usually people, after practicing it for a while, they will also feel more relaxed. But it's not the same as a, as a like standard relaxation approach. It, Actually, at times it can be very challenging to practice it, not at all re relaxing. Yeah? So some people call mindfulness a very active non-doing. Yeah? So it, it, it really requires effort to be in a mindful state when, while we are practicing it, before it becomes more and more natural. Yeah? And sometimes it doesn't feel relaxed at all. Yeah? But, so, but, but that's part of the story. Yeah? What I heard from many participants actually also here at, at John Moore's at the mindfulness programs that have been running is that it is life changing. Yeah? Even after a few sessions ma many participants said so. And it is this, this different way of relating to one's experiences. So one sees effects easily that the people are less stressed yeah, because stress is not only what happens around us, but a lot about what happens in one's own mind. And then they they have more emotional freedom, they have more more cognitive freedom, they are more creative. P people often say they suddenly they can think outside the box, and things like this. Yeah. So there there are many benefits, yeah? and one also see it in, sees it in. Uh, various health related parameters yeah? not only in, in the mind but it actually it has a physic can have a physical effect as well I think it's it's very individual because it is not about ex 
changing what we experience or what we think. So it is in no way dogmatic or something like this. It is just an additional way of how we do experience. Yeah? And this cannot be scary. I mean, some I think uh, some people may do not may not want to to change, and then probably mindfulness practice will not work, and they will not be interested in it. Let's and that's completely fine. Yeah? But um, the the change people usually report it is actually very positive. Mm. So I just remember from from one lady with two um, adolescent boys. Uh, and she she took part in the mindfulness course and after two sessions these these boys said mom what what happened to you you're so nice suddenly <laughs> they didn't know that she was taking part in this in these uh, courses yeah i mean why the one thing is of course that it is so much in the media and then people learn about it and, and so on but the, and I think a more profound reason is that actually the, this mindfulness practice is about something that is can be relevant in so many different areas. Yeah? It is in every area where people experience <laughs> and the experience is somehow relevant yeah? then, then it, it, it can have a benefit I think. Yeah? This, this, and and I, I can't really say why it is exactly at this time that it comes up. Yeah? So maybe there's a greater interest in, in looking inside. Yeah? If, if the econ economy doesn't satisfy us so much anymore, maybe it's time to look for somewhere else. So this could be what this is just speculation. I, I mean, the question is wh whether multitasking really means multitasking. Yeah? So, if to what extent people are really able to multitask, and if if it's, it doesn't mean that the quality suffers a lot of what we do, yeah. that that's a question. I mean, if I'm able to do five things, let's say, perfectly, juggling them and do them perfectly, then then that's that's excellent. Yeah? And I think with improved mindfulness skills, probably the ability to do so improves as well. Mm -hmm. So because there will be less distraction, it will be easier to, to focus on, on what we are doing and, and so it, it should increase the ability to multitask. But I'm not sure that multitasking is always the best solution. Yeah? So I think there's a lot of benefit in, in really focusing on one thing and doing it properly and then maybe going to the next thing instead of having five balls in the air at the same time. Yeah. From the mindfulness perspective I think it is not really a quick fix. Yeah? So it's not something like throwing in a pill or so I feel stressed oh no, now let's quickly be mindful <laughs> or something like this. Um, although it may actually to a certain extent even work. Yeah? So if one just is able in in a stressful situation to make this inner step back and just say okay now I just for a moment I, I just relax yeah? then this is amazing but if you haven't practiced it it will be very difficult to do so yeah? so in, in, in a sense mindfulness practice prepares us to be able to, to deal with stressful situations in a, in a different way yeah? and then if we're able to really just for a moment to say okay now I take a minute or two and just focus on the breathing for instance one can also focus on something else but breathing is quite, quite useful in, in various ways just focus on this and just experience the sensation as clearly as possible and let everything else not suppress it, but just let it pass by. All the worries, all the rumination, all the inner dramas, all the ifs and whys and wouldn't it and, and so on. Just let it pass by for a moment and, and this really helps a lot. Yeah? This, this gives back the space that sometimes easily disappears if, if so much is, is thrown on us. Yeah? So the I think for scientifically not all the mechanisms are, have been understood yet. Yes? So many of the programs or, or the research programs so far have been looking at whether mindfulness practice is effective and has 
has the positive outcomes on well-being and health and, and so on and, and there's good evidence that it does have but what exactly the mechanisms are this is something we only start really taking apart yeah? and what we what we see so far in our own research is that mindfulness influences on the one hand how we are aware of our emotions and then following on from this how we regulate them yeah? so it gives more freedom to really deal with our emotional states in, in different ways and also how we how we respond cognitively let's say yeah? so and and one aspect there that we are very interested in is what we call negative self thinking yeah? so this habit to have negative thoughts about ourselves yeah? putting us, ourselves down yeah? and there it seems that, that through mindfulness practice this this habit yeah, this habitual tendency it, it also decreases yeah, so this is all so I think it has a cognitive component and an emotional component and underneath this there is attention yeah, so our attentional flexibility our ability to focus on something our ability to maintain an alert state this underpins all this yeah? without without attention then all the other aspects don't really function and there the evidence is strongest that mindfulness changes the attentional functions yeah? we, we see changes in in brain activity we even see changes in brain structure after a few weeks of of mindfulness practice yeah? There are only very few studies, so I don't want to make very big claims about this, but it looks like that it may have a positive effect on the immune system. For instance, that uh, if then participants or when the participants were, were um, or received a, a flu shot, that the immune system responded much faster than, than it usually does in comparable people. Yeah? After they practice for a few weeks uh, mindfulness, there seems to be, seems to be some link even to to the aging of the body. Yeah? So that there there are these so-called telomeres that w when we grow older they don't regenerate as as much. Oh. I'm not really a biologist, or, uh, so but so they are considered to be a marker of of the aging organism. Yeah? And it seems that the length of these telomeres is not as much affected in people who meditate regularly. Yeah, so there are a few aspects, but, but the evidence is, is not very strong, so I don't want to make very strong claims. There are just a few studies about this so far. I mean, the, the interesting thing about the, the pain management, first of all, is that this is where mindfulness practice came into Western psychology or around maybe 30 years ago with the work of John Kabat-Zinn. He developed a, this popular mindfulness-based ba stress redu reduction program for people with chronic pain where no other treatment really helped. Yeah, and it was quite successful. And it's not that mindfulness practice per se just removes all the pain, wipes it out and that's it and then it's gone, but it, it helps the people to, to deal in a very different way with, with pain, especially with, with chronic pain and, and it takes, uh, is able to reduce or take away all the secondary aspects of, of the pain. Yeah? So uh, probably we all know that even if we have very strong toothache that for a moment, if we think about something else, so, so, so it's almost gone. Yeah, it's it's gone, and so it means it's it's not completely real. But it, it depends on our attention. Yeah? And if if we our attention is more flexible, and all the secondary processes that that ha make the, the pain uh, to be to become a chronic problem, yeah? they they can be dissolved through mindfulness practice. Um, we have um, two main main strands of research at the moment. Uh, the one, it's what we call uh, healthy aging, the healthy aging project, where it is mainly about the question whether mindfulness practice can slow down cognitive aging. Yeah. So, 
The sad news is that once we reach the age of around 30, then actually cognitive decline starts. Yeah? So the cognitive functions, one slows down, and especially so-called executive functions, they, they deteriorate slowly, and also working memory is affected. And from the evidence that is out there, it looks like that mindfulness practice might be able to to slow down this this process, but so far this were all just uh, studies, basically cross-sectional studies, not really following people over longer periods and really see if there are causal links. Yeah? It's just comparing people who practice mindfulness with people who, who don't, and while in the uh, normal population one sees such a uh, age-related decline in people who practice mindfulness for a longer time, you don't see this. But this is still doesn't tell about the causality, yeah? and and now we we are running, we are preparing studies where we want to look at this over longer time periods and and see if actually over time we can see such an effect. And I think it, it's pretty exciting. And from all the evidence that is out there so far, I would really expect that that it will work. But we still have to show it. Yeah? This is this is one big area where we're looking at cognitive processes, how, how it changes in the brain and, and whether it can, uh, can slow down the cognitive aging process. The other project is more related to, to eating behavior and eating behavior is very interesting. I mean we know that obesity is one of the big challenges for, for our society now and we know that eating behavior to, to a large extent is psychologically motivated yeah? and at before I talked about the, the importance of emotion and, and cognitive processes and so on and we think that by uh, increasing one's mindfulness through practice then also these cognitive and emotional processes change and they will change how we relate to to food yeah? and should give us more freedom to to choose in a, in a smarter way yeah, what what we eat, how much we are going to eat, whether we are able to stick to the to the kind of diet we, we would like to we would like to stick to and and, and things like this. Yeah. It's more and more understood that this is not necessarily the case. And I mean, on, on these mindfulness courses that I've been running, there, by, if any, there were maybe a few Bo Buddhists, uh, and uh, there were a few hundred participants, yeah, and nobody has to change their belief for this. It's really a way of, of relating to one's experiences. It's not about the changing how we think or what we believe or, or something like this. Yeah. And, and then if one really wants, if one looks more closely what Buddhism is about, it's not a religion. Yeah. It, is, it, is a, it is a very smart, I think, a very smart system of, of practices that can help people. Yeah. Sometimes, and quite often, it can be practiced like a religion and get the status, but this was not what, as far as we know, Buddha had in mind at all. Yeah. And so, but we, now we have the chance to, to, to take away all these, let's say, religious things and really come to, the, to these practices. Yeah? And the, the word that in Buddhism, for instance, is, is used for meditation, bhavana in, in the Sanskrit word, it just means to develop a habit, yeah? to practice something. Yeah? It is not anything religious, it's just... So in the same way as, as we train our, our, bo our body, it, it makes sense to also train our mind. Yeah? So it's a, and then it's just having the right tools to do so.